Good morning. Welcome back to the second series of session on Wednesday at ICAD London. My name is still Christoph Sauerwein and I'm still so far the, direct, the academic director of ICAD and CEO. Um, and today it's my great pleasure to welcome Kathleen Parrish, who is well known to ICAD, and um, and to, she will she will present on grief, and I'll come back to that. So, Kathleen, um, you the director of clinical services at Cottonwood Tucson, Tucson, Tucson. Sorry, my French is ripping now. Um, and um, you, you're a professional counselor and supervisor, um, holding and having earned two masters, one in marriage and family therapy, and the other one, which always interests me when they're a little bit outside the box, in religious education, I think. Um, and um, you work primarily with trauma survivors, which makes you the best person to talk about grief, probably. Um, you're also the co-author of a book, the Essence of Resilience, Stories of Tri Triumph Over Trauma. Now, um, the title you gave to your presentation is Diagnostic Consideration and Interventions in the Treatment of Complex Grief. Um, I think that's the first time at ICAD we go so deep and, 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 and straight to the point of grief. So I'm very grateful you, you, you bring that with your wisdom and your knowledge today. Um, there's two things in, in grief. How do we diagnose all that? But then, how do we help people in massive, massive pain? Um, so I'm not going to unveil anything more than that, and I'll leave it to you, Kathleen. Thank you and welcome. Good morning. How's everybody? Is everybody awake? Yeah. All right, I'm going to just do a survey. How many of you had more than four cups of coffee this morning? OK, there's one over there. Look, our, our technician over there. And under three? Okay, all right. I had three, so I'm going to be really energized. I'm a bit of an introvert, so coming in here to a room full of people to hear me talk about grief is like, woo! My little introvert self is awake on coffee, so, um, so good morning. Hey, everybody raise their hands and say hello, Leslie. So Leslie is right here. She's my best friend since I was 17. And she flew with me to, from Kentucky to come and be here this morning so to support me. And she's got my water because I got a little cold, so she's like taking care of me. So um, I was thinking about a topic for ICAB uh, several months ago. And um, I thought, this is kind of a heavy topic. I'm like, ugh, this is a big one to tackle. So I know that it's going to feel a little heavy. Um, I feel like this is a really timely topic. And the thing that really piqued my interest in this topic was the idea of, um, in, in, the, in the States, it seems like every day when we turn on the news, there's another mass shooting. There's a bombing, there's this, there's that. There was just recently a bombing in uh, Sri Lanka, right? There was bombings in Paris nightclubs, Florida. There's shootings, mass shootings all over the place. And in the wake of that, what I think about is that there are so many, many, many people affected by this idea of complex grief. So we're going to talk a little bit about the differences between grief as we might traditionally think and complex grief and how we might treat complex grief uh, moving forward. How many clinicians in the room? Can I just see a show of hands? All right, great, thanks. Um, it's good to know. <clears throat> Any hecklers? Just so I know where you are. <laughs> All right, I like to know where you are. <clears throat> So um, I want you to just think for a minute about your own experiences of grief. We all have them, whether it's the loss of a loved one, the loss of a job, maybe the loss of a pet. I have a friend who lost a pet yesterday who she loved, and that can be a really profound grief. Right? So a lot of things can really incorporate what we might think of as grief. It's really a human condition, and I thought about that a lot. Grief is something that we we have the ability to cope with. It's a part of our condition in life is that we love and the cost of loving is also loss. Right? So that's a condition that we have the capacity to deal with within ourselves. It's difficult, it's painful, and yet we all know it. So we need to just think about your own experience of grief just for a minute and just reflect on that. Maybe what that was like for you. What helped you to move forward when you were grieving what that felt like inside, maybe how other people responded to you when you were grieving. I want you to just give that some thought this morning. This is not an exhaustive list. There are so many things that we grieve. 
and I don't take grief as just death. Right? It can be so many different things and have a lot of layers to grief. The more layers, the more I consider something to be a complex grief. Um, I don't know that there's a simple grief, do you? I don't think grief is simple. Um, and so when we think about grief and we're, we're treating people who have grief issues, I like to think about the idea of not just grief but of loss. What is the loss implied? Whether it's the loss of connection or the loss of relationship or the loss of ability. So loss can look like a lot of things. So I want us to just be open about what, what really constitutes a loss. One of the things I'm aware of, you like my drawing? Isn't that fun? Although these guys are kind of sitting on these guys' heads, which I don't know. Um, but I think about loss, you know, when we think about maybe one person who passed away, I think about how many people are affected by grief and loss on a day-to-day -day basis. Think about someone that you might have lost, and then think about how many people were affected also by that loss. So we can have like the immediate family that's affected by loss. Um, we can have maybe a small friend group, maybe work colleagues, and then maybe the larger group of people who knew that people are grieving. And when we think about grief that way, you know, one loss can affect so many people in different ways. <coughs> when we think about what's happening in our world today and the rise in violence in our culture, right, mass shootings, how many people are affected, and then those, the staggering sort of layers of loss that are present for, for those kind of events. So just some basic definitions. I'm using broad, kind of global, sweeping terms to define grief. But it's being deprived of someone or something of value, something that we really held a lot of value in. That's really what, what loss is. And grief is that sorrow that we feel maybe at someone's death or at that loss. That sort of longing ache to see them again. Right? That sort of thinking about that. Um, uh, my friend who recently lost her dog was saying, you know, I can imagine, like, I, I think I hear him walking around, right? Or I think um, sometimes I've heard parents say, well, I, you know, I feel like that person's away at summer camp, my kid. They're going to come back. Or they're sp spending the night at someone's house and they're going to come back. It feels like it's a dream state often for people. It's that grief, sorrow, and that deep sorrow that we feel. And then um, bereavement is just that state of, of being. And bereavement can last for uh, different periods of time, depending. We're going to talk about that in a minute. So just some basic symptoms we might see when we're thinking about uncomplicated grief. Denial or shock, like that person's gone and, and they're on a trip and they're coming back. Or did this really happen? I can't believe this happened, especially maybe if it was a more sudden loss. We think about it over and over again. Anger is a common one, right? We get angry at the loss, and that's part of that stage of grieving. Um, sadness. Sometimes people have increasing anxiety around loss or death. Changes in appetite, difficulty with focus. These are all really common symptoms that people might feel. They're not out of the ordinary when we're talking about, about grief and loss. How many in your practice work with people who have grief and loss issues? Okay. It's pretty common, right? It's something that we see in that as clinicians we need to be able to treat. One of the things I know about grief in just in my own life is that there's sort of an ebb and flow. Sometimes, this is my silly example, right? But sometimes grief feels like we're splashing in a puddle and we just get our feet wet a little. It doesn't feel so bad. We can get through it, right? We're aware of it, but we can push through our day. And it's sort of it's ebbing a little bit. And we feel like, good, I'm on an upswing with grief. And then sometimes grief feels like this. Right? The next day we wake up and there's no rhyme or reason when we're grieving. One day it feels okay, we can get through. And the next day we feel completely flooded by the ocean. It doesn't feel like a puddle. It feels like an ocean knocking us over. Can people relate to this in their own grief? The ebb and the flow of grief. Right. So um, talk with me just a minute. I want to hear from you guys. In your own grief experience, so I'm tapping on my microphone. I'm a mess today. <clears throat> but I haven't started coughing, so we're good. Um, tell me a little bit when you've been in a grief period. What are some things you hear from people? What are things people say? Well-meaning things, but what are some of the things that maybe people have said to you or that you've said to them in an attempt to be helpful? It'll, It'll get easier. It'll be all right. What else? He's in a better place. He's in a better place. Stay strong. Stay strong. It's your fault. It's your fault. Ooh, that's a big one. Yep. It wasn't your fault. It's it wasn't your fault. Okay. What else? 
Time's a great healer. Okay. I know exactly how you feel. It happened to my mother too. Oh, okay. <laughs> What's the other one we see on the internet a lot when something happens? Everything, Two words. Everything happens for a reason. Everything happens for a reason. Self care. Thoughts and prayers. Yeah. Thoughts and prayers to Paris. Thoughts and prayers to Orlando and I clip you. Thoughts and prayers to Right. Likes and hearts. Right? So think about it's an interesting way that we handle grief, right? Let me ask a question for those who answered. Did those things help you? Did you feel deeply moved and like you're on your way to healing? No. But we say them. Why do we say those things to people who are grieving? Because we don't know how to handle it. Yeah. Other thoughts? It just brings those uncomfortable feelings up in yourself. So it does, doesn't it? We don't know what to do when someone's grieving. I was talking to my friend Leslie about this this morning. Someone's grieving and we go, oh, I hope you're doing okay, but we really don't want to know how they're doing. Right? What we don't ask them is, tell me what you miss most about that person. Right? Tell me what it's like for you to get up in the morning when your longtime spouse is gone. Right? Tell me what that's like for you to, to, to know that they're not coming back. Ooh, we don't want to know that, right? We don't want to ask. We might make that person sad, but they're already sad. Right? We want them to just shut that down and be quiet and go away. And that's our stuff in there. That's our discomfort. Right? And truthfully, we don't want to get too connected to grief also because we're afraid that it might happen to us. Right? We have a friend with their child has cancer and they're passing away. I'm a mom. That terrifies me. Ooh, I hope you're okay, but, but I don't want to know so much because I don't want to be afraid to. So I think it's important that we kind of recognize our own platitudes that we use when we're dealing with the grieving and how we might begin to step into that with them a little bit and provide different kind of support. So when we're talking about um, uncomplicated grief, again, I don't think there's any simple grief, but the term un uncomplicated is more of that diagnostic term. There's not a realistic timeline, <coughs> but they usually say uncomplicated grief considers six months to a year. Now that doesn't mean that after a year people are magically cured, but it means maybe that the, the realization of the loss is beginning to settle a little bit for people. They're beginning to reach out once again. Maybe some of their distress is starting to resolve a little bit, six months to a year. Um, but complicated grief doesn't show improvement over time. People stay stuck in that process, and their functioning tends to deteriorate. They tend to withdraw more. That's the difference between a complicated grief and uncomplicated grief. One of the differences. Is it, is it, is it, all, is it also about one's plan and one's unplanned? In other words, you know, you know you've got a hand to die, you know, you're yes. planning for another one because she's been shooting something not planned. Yes, we're definitely going to talk about that a little bit more, too. That's a really good point. Did you guys hear that? Yeah, yeah. No. It's so often, and we'll talk about that. So what constitutes a complicated grief? So the difference that I think of is a couple of things. One is that complicated grief um, is an unexpected thing that happened. It's a, often a sudden, sometimes violent. There's often a traumatic event involved with that loss. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, we, when we lose our grandparent who's in their 90s, it's a hard loss. We feel a connection to them, but it's an anticipated loss. Right? We can anticipate that that person is going to leave us soon, and it's hard, and we don't want it to happen, and we're very, very sad when it happens. But it makes sense in terms of our frame of reference. Right? You know that we get old and we pass away. It's, it's part of that earlier where we talked about the human experience. We don't anticipate that our child is going to pass away from cancer, or that there's going to be an accident, or that you're going to send your child to school and they're going to be killed in a shooting. That's not something that we have a file for in our brains, and it doesn't make any sense. Right? And that constitutes a complicated loss. Yes? What about, um, say, the time that your child is disabled or their life is on with addiction? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that can be both. It depends on, on and, and I think grief is also a personal experience. So some people, um, view that grief differently than others. And we'll talk about sort of the lenses through which we view grief, too, because that impacts how we see things. Yeah, that's a good question. Did everyone hear that question? Yeah? Okay. 
Yes, suicide is a, is a complicated group. We're going to talk about that a little. Those are all really great questions. You guys are ahead of me a little today. Um, so these are interesting things. What we see with complicated grief is a ruminating thing. Right? It's over and over and over, repeating the scenario in which the loss occurred. And it almost becomes obsessive. I've read some research that suggests there's an addictive component around uh, complex grief. That it becomes a, a very much this cognitive distortion that gets replayed over and over again. Um, it's a lot of obsession about the loved one's death researching it, thinking about it, seeing it over and over again, unable to separate themselves from that. Um, a lot of either intense focus on or avoidance of reminders, either or, but not able to really um, be in a, a modulated sense about that. Um, and then a lot of detached and numbness from people, a lot of social withdrawal as well. Yeah. I mean, a lot of those characteristics there remind me of depression. Well, yes. I mean, would you, what do you think about seeing depression as a, uh, as a complicated grief? As a yes, I think, de I think depression is um, an outcropping of complicated grief. I think when you have complicated grief, you can have, as a diagnostic consideration, you can have depression, mm -hmm. and you can also have um, uh, PTSD. I've seen both kind of mingled in with, and, and anxiety disorders. You can see a lot of those co-occurring pieces that go along with a complicated grief. Mm -hmm. So we talked about um, sort of traditionally our ideas about grief being either a, a puddle or um, a wave in the ocean, right? But complex grief is really a tsunami. Right? It's a huge crashing wave that devastates. It wipes out everything that maybe that person understood or knew about themselves, what they understood about the world what they were able to conceptualize, what made sense to them no longer makes sense. And this is sort of that traumatic piece of complex grief, is that it challenges our understanding of what it should have been, the way it should have been, um, how it should have gone down. It doesn't match with our anticipation and our expectation. So it's very much a tsunami when that poor gentleman there is going to get swallowed up. So additional symptoms, you know, a lot of bitterness, um, a lack of meaning, difficulty trusting other people. Right? Um, and then having a hard time, this is really key, having a hard time thinking back on the positive experiences. Now sometimes in a well-meaning state we might say to them, why don't you think about the happy memories you had with that person? Right? That doesn't help someone with complex grief. They're not able to do that at that moment. And that's the struggle. They're in that uh, rumination about the person's death and about their loss. And their connection to that person is around their death rather than their life. And so these kind of statements where we try to have them think about the positive events and the gratitude and all of those things that we might be well intended in trying to create for them, they're not able to access. So when I was thinking about <clears throat> all of the events that have been happening and the impact of, of complex grief on our culture and our world. Um, I wanted to just capture some images from things, and I ran out of space. So if you think about the different events, um, about a month ago I stood here at 9-11 Memorial. It was the first time I'd actually seen it in person. I've always wanted to see it. That's not me, but <laughs> it's an image from the internet. Um, and I have my son with me, who's 11, right? and he was, wasn't born yet for 9-11. <clears throat> and he stood here, and he was reading the names, and he was learning from the tour guide about some of the children that died in 9-11. And he's a very sensitive child. And he stood there, and I'm thinking, how is he responding to this memorial? Because it's really powerful. Anyone seen the 9-11 memorial? OK, a few of us. And when you're there, it really is its striking, of the, just the sheer amount of loss that happened that day. Um, and it's a beautiful, they did a beautiful job with this memorial. Um, but my son was standing there, and he, he has no reference point for 9-11, right? He knows that there's been a lot of shootings, but he, he didn't understand this kind of loss. And his question for me is, Mom, he said, he's very cute, but he goes, did we avenge this? Did we avenge this? And it struck me that that's how we often feel 
when there's a complex loss. How this hurts, I'm angry, how am I gonna get this back? How did this happen? Someone needs to suffer, some punishment needs to happen. It's our anger at the loss, right? So my answer to him, I had to think for a minute. <laughs> He's like, did we do something? What, what did we do about this loss? And it struck me how powerful that idea is that there's this huge loss and this void, and what do we do with that, right? And, and I thought about that for the survivors. Like, how do they feel? Right? I wasn't related to, the, to these people that passed in 9-11 in a personal way. I didn't know them. But how did those people feel right? with that kind of loss, that void that's left for them? Yeah. And I said to my son, no amount of punishment or vengeance will bring these people back. Right? No going back after somebody is going to change what happened. And that's the acceptance piece that I, as an adult, can come to over time, but in his young brain, it was hard to understand. So just being aware of that impact of complex grief on people is that immediate response that he might have had. Someone's going to pay for this. Something has to be done. This doesn't feel okay to me. I love that you didn't shame him. No, yeah, yeah. No, he's very open. We have lots of open conversations. He's lots of fun. But so I want you to just think for a minute as you look at these images about all of these people that were impacted. Do you remember my drawing earlier with the little stick figure? For each person represented, imagine that spreading out to all the people. Think about all the people in the world that are impacted by complex grief, who lost someone in this event, an unanticipated, unexpected, <coughs> violent loss. Right? And that sense of who's going to avenge this? How is this going to heal? This isn't okay, this isn't right, this isn't how it was supposed to be. And These kind of losses. It brought the country to its knees. It did. As well. It was a devastating loss. <laughs> All of these events. Yeah. Here's an interesting fact, right? And I don't want to go off in the other direction because this is a really interesting topic. It can generate a lot of discussions about gun control and all this, and I don't want to get into those today. I want to stay focused on complex loss. But let me just say this one thing, and this is interesting. We've become desensitized to this kind of loss, yeah. right? As a, as a world, as a culture, as therapists sometimes, we can get desensitized. We hope you're okay. Thoughts and prayers, right? And I was looking at some research that said, how long do these stay in the news before we stop talking about them, right? And at first, you know, the one that spiked the highest was the Sandy Hook shootings with the small children. Okay. That was unthinkable. It was an unthinkable tragedy that happened, right? And for all of us, I know in the States, it was just shocking. Because we all thought that could have been my kid. Right? It was an unthinkable loss. But those shootings now, one day, the most recent one, one day, before people really stopped talking about them. So if we're not talking about them as a culture, then I think as clinicians, we're a bit desensitized <coughs> to talking about them with our clients. It's that, I hope you're OK. I hope you can deal with all of this mess on your own. Figure it out. But don't talk to me about it. I might get uncomfortable, right? So I, I want to just open our awareness of the profound impact of this and our desensitization to grief and loss in our, in our culture, in our world. Okay? But it was interesting to me that I couldn't fit all these, and there were so many, many more that I didn't capture in here. And another one, I think, recently, last week, in the States, another shooting. Yeah. Another one yesterday? Yeah. Colorado? Yeah. It's almost every day, mm -hmm. right? So when we think about that, I just want to continue to create awareness of the impact. I told you this was going to be heavy. <laughs> I want to just create awareness of that impact on our culture and on our world, that you're going to be seeing people if you're a clinician and your practice. You're going to know people, your friend network. Eventually, someone you know will be touched by this creating awareness of what that means for us and how we help people heal, because they're going to need help healing. They're going to be able, need to be able to talk about this. The other piece that we sometimes struggle with this common is our su increasing suicide rates right? on the rise, drug overdoses, right? all of those things on the rise. Those are all forms of complex grief, not, un not expected griefs. And so one of the things, do you like this tree? Isn't that great? This is what it looks like when grief and trauma meet. Right? And as a clinician, I don't always know where to start. Oof, where do I start with this? Okay. 
in my EMDR training a while back, they said start with the alligator closest to the boat. <laughs> right? And I like that. It's where, which, which thing is closest? Which thing has the most heat? Which thing feels the worst to the person? And that's where we start. But sometimes it's hard to know which one that is. Which one do you choose? Right? And we don't always know. And, and it, it gets woven together. We were, we were just talking earlier. And, and also you can throw in depression and anxiety. And, um, and one of the other things that I think about is, are there, and we were talking about the lens earlier. A gentleman back here asked the question. We are talking about the lens through which people view grief is often um, influenced by earlier experiences in life. So if someone had a history of childhood trauma and they have a core belief of lacking worth and value, of not feeling loved, and they have a complex grief on top of that, it gets interwoven with that perspective of themselves in the world. And the lens through which they view subsequent traumas and subsequent losses is impacted by that core belief. Does that make sense? So we have to know what those core beliefs are too so that we can help them in their healing process. So we have to do a thorough history taking when we're talking about complex grief. Because sometimes the grief may not look very complex, but the person has all the symptoms. And usually it's because there's an earlier trauma informing that grief. And if we can know that and understand that, we can help that person work through that a little differently. So we kind of covered these things. Um, so um, I'm just talking ahead of my slides, so don't you like that? Um, so one of the things that I know is that complex grief doesn't respond to our traditional interventions for grief. This complex grief isn't go write a grief letter and come back and share it with me. Right? Um, as we said, it's not thoughts and prayers. It's not um, those kind of things. It responds in different ways, and we have to really understand and be thoughtful. So we're going to talk a little later about interventions. Um, So I think we covered this. There's a lot of self-blame, and it's interesting. I think someone up here mentioned they were told it was their fault. right? And often you don't need to tell anybody. I think that's a terrible thing to say, but that person already has that core belief. Yeah. Right? This thing was my fault. I could have prevented it. I could have changed it. I could have stopped it. If only, what if I had? Right? And there's that idea of self-blame for that loss underneath. And we talked about depression. Often they have a lot of depression, a lot of anxiety, guilt, shame. Um, and this idea down here, um, the, the belief that life isn't worth living without my loved one, right? and wishing that they could have died along with that person. And I want to just call attention to those two things. If you have someone you're working with or you know someone who has complex grief, you need to be alert for the potential for suicide. Right? And I'll tell you that because about a month ago in the news, two parents killed themselves. Parkland shooting victims, dad and a Sandy Hook victim's dad. Within a week, they both suicided. Right. So we need to be aware of the potential for suicide in our clients or our friends or our families who have complex grief. It is a risk factor. You have to be on your toes for it. And they may not tell you. So you have to ask, and you have to ask very specifically. Right. So knowing that there's a risk and um, doing it. So it's interesting, I was looking at what are risk factors? What constitutes a complex grief from not? And then what are risk factors? So there was an interesting article um, that John Wilson did on the nature of complicated grief. And he's identified these factors as being risk factors for complicated grief. Right? I'll read them out loud if you can't see the slides. A death of a child or a spouse, <clears throat> especially a long-term spouse. A death of a, a child or a family member. Sorry, I'm going to get a little drink of water. Lack of family support or social support, people who are isolated or at higher risk. <clears throat> and then how did they find out about the death? I had a friend uh, recently who found her other friend passed away, didn't show up for work, went to her house, and she found her passed away. Okay. That, would, that would be a very difficult thing to see. Knowing that someone passed away and finding them after they passed away are very different things. Right? So how did they find out? Sometimes I've had people find out on social media. Someone posted it on Facebook that somebody died and they had no idea. And that becomes very complicated for them. I didn't know. I had to read about it on the internet. 
And we talked about the violence and the traumatic death as often constitutes a complicated grief. Yeah, may I just Yes. 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 Yes, and I, re I reference multiple losses a little later ahead. Because that's a good point. So when you have multiple losses, and you see this often with older people who start losing a lot of their friends as they go. Sometimes you have individuals I've seen who are older and their friends go into nursing homes and they pass and they pass, and um, when their parents are gone and their siblings die, and you have all those multiple losses that begin to stack up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good point. Thank you. Do, do human beings somehow, as they get older, find ways of accepting the loss as being part of human condition? I think they can, and I think that's that would you would see more with an uncomplicated grief is that we sort of begin to accept. I think people with complicated grief do recover and get to that point. But sometimes they get stuck in that space where it's hard to, hard to get there. Yeah. Um, so young females are at higher risk. Yeah. Question. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I appreciate that. Um, it's interesting because when you read the literature, the, the word losses is used. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but you're right. It's not, we're not going to find them again, right? But we will, in a sense. We'll talk about that more. <laughs> yes. Well, I think it goes back to understanding how they view the loss and what that's about for each one of them, because very, grief is very individual for each person. And so understanding what that meant to them and finding meaning in that is really important. Which one would be more set to mental health issues that came down the road? One, one is showing emotional, one is not Hard to know. I wish I could predict that. <laughs> but it's a, it's a good question mark. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I think I think we anticipate that people who are more emotional may be less resilient, but I don't know that I would necessarily agree with that. Mm -hmm. That would depend. Another question? We will. I've got a bunch of interventions on the tail end of, of how we treat this. Yep. Definitely. Thank you. Other questions? Yeah. It's one of the things anger, right? Like mm -hmm. Yes. 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 That's, I think that's a very common experience for people in terms of processing grief as anger. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it's okay to be angry. Right? I think it's okay to question and to wrangle around with that loss a bit. I think that's how we heal. Yeah. We can't get to acceptance until we've understood what we've lost. Right? I think I've covered most of that. So in, the, in this last piece right here, is this idea that the loss broke the rules. Right? This wasn't supposed to go this way. Um, I was working with a woman whose son suicided recently, and that loss broke the rules. It didn't, it didn't fit. It wasn't supposed to happen this way. Okay, parents should not outlive their children. Right? That's the rule. <coughs> so a loss that violates that rule or that idea we have in our head. Now I'm going to show you a video. And I'll tell you, the video is going to be interesting because, well, you'll see. But, but I want you to just pay attention. So this movie is very old. In my opinion, it was poorly done. So you're probably asking, why are you showing us a video of a movie that was poorly done? There's a piece in this one scene that I just want you to see. And the idea is this, is that when people lose someone traumatically, they didn't get a chance to say goodbye. Yep. Right? They didn't get closure the way they wanted to. When a spouse dies that maybe has been ill for a long time, you work to the point where you say your goodbyes, hopefully. You say what you need to say. That does help us heal a little differently than never being able to say what we needed to say. Yeah. Is this going to be triggering? 
Maybe? Okay. Thank you for asking. Um, so this scene is from the movie um, that Robin Williams did a long time ago. So when you think about Robin Williams and what happened for him and his suicide and the fact that that is probably a complex loss for his family and for us as a world, right? That when we talk about him, it's like uh, we have that feeling, right? Um, so this movie was called What Dreams May Come. Did anyone see this? Okay. It was a hard movie to watch. It was heavy. His wife dies in a car accident, right? And he's trying to get back to her. It's that desperation of trying to reconnect. And this is a scene where he is saying what he needs to say, but she can't hear him. I'm sorry, babe. There's some things I have to say. I've only got a few moments left. I'm sorry for all the things I'll never give you. I'll never buy you another meatball sub with extra sauce. That was a big one. I'll never make you smile. I just wanted us to be old together. There's two old farts laughing at each other as our bodies fell apart. Together at the end, by that lake in your painting. It was our heaven, see? There's lots of things to miss. Books, naps, kisses, and fights. <laughs> God, we had some great ones. Thank you for those. Thank you for every kindness. Thank you for our children. For the first time I saw them. Thank you for being someone I was always proud to be with. For your guts, for your sweetness, for how you always looked, for how I always wanted to touch you. You were my life. I apologize for every time I failed you, especially this one. watch yeah okay it's that opportunity to say what we need to say what I'm gonna miss about you what I loved about you thank you for I'm sorry for those are things that people with complex grief never got to say that they long to say and we don't ask them those questions right? it's called what dreams may come it's not the greatest movie but that scene is really powerful <laughs> It's just that opportunity to say those things that people often don't have a chance to say. And just an interesting question is how do we deal with people's losses? I don't know about you, but when I've been sitting in a session with somebody who had a profound loss, it's really hard to sit with, mm -hmm. right? Especially when you, you know, it's something that's very close to you or something that you can identify with. And I think we need to understand our own countertransference and the difference between countertransference and compassion, right? And where's that line? Anyone ever wept with a patient before? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's okay, yeah. right? I think sharing that grief with them is okay. Walking into that space with them and holding them in that in that grief for a little bit, I think that's a really powerful healing thing because not many people are willing to walk in that space with them. So knowing and knowing that sometimes maybe we need support in processing their losses too. We need a place to be to connect. So um, at a, my so when we have a complex grief. Which way do we go? So we talked about this. The alligator closest to the boat. So you'll never forget that. <laughs> Start with the thing that hurts the most. Stay with that and begin to explore. Right. I always do a really thorough history. Because I need to know, right? Is there a childhood history of trauma? Was there abuse? That's why it's important to do that history and to understand the themes underneath. And how does this theme match other themes? 
Right. And understanding the interweave between grief and trauma. And sometimes trauma interventions work well for complex grief, and sometimes they don't. And so you kind of um, begin to tiptoe in and see what's going to work for it very, for, very um, well first. So give permission to grieve too. It's okay. Sometimes they're just sobbing, and that's okay. <coughs> so I'm about to cough again. Pardon me. So giving permission and understanding. Sometimes I have to help people with an emotional vocabulary, particularly if they've grown up in, a, in an environment or a home where they weren't allowed to express feelings, and they don't know what to do with all this. Sometimes I say, if I were you, I might feel really angry about that loss. I might feel really sad about that. It's OK to be sad. It's OK to be sad for a long time. You might be sad for a long time. You might be angry right now. Helping people understand those and understanding their family system. What were they allowed to do with emotion? What were they not? Because sometimes that can impact complicated grief as well. I have a question. Yeah. What, um, are you gathering the trauma history? Uh -huh. I, I, I'm sorry, I kind of have my own thing. I, um, I really try to do a very thorough history and really looking at relationship dynamics. You know, like a very thorough biopsychosocial history can help me just get a feeling and then pulling things apart from there. When did you get your bio? Did you just write it over time? I did, yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah. But afterward, if you want to talk more about that, we sure can. <coughs> Other questions? Hmm? Yeah. I just find it interesting. Looking back at a significant amount of grief and loss and, and trauma in my history, and being able to, I, I love being at this topic because I could really feel the energy of the therapist. Mm -hmm. They didn't need to say, yes. We're not going to go there. Yes. And um, the first time that I looked up with another therapist and saw a tear running down mm -hmm. his eye. Mm -hmm was transformative mm -hmm. for me. Absolutely. Was, I, yep. I absolutely could grieve then yep. and felt like I was being called. Yes. But it was almost like the message was, you can't go there. Mm -hmm. we're, we're not going to go right. there. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, keep it together. Yeah, right? exactly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Don't fall apart on yeah. me. Yeah. Like, we don't right. talk about this. Mm -hmm. We yeah. as therapists don't talk about this. We don't. We don't. We're not very, Thank it you. doesn't make us anxious. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah, I'll admit to that. So I think understanding that, and um, as, as clinicians, as people in recovery, working and, and knowing people that are grieving, being OK to go there, you know, asking those questions, getting specific. Right? I sat with a friend who had lost somebody, and I said, what do you miss most about that person? And they kind of went, what? I can tell you that? Yeah, tell me. Well, I miss the way that they would share meals with me, the way they would cook. I miss their laugh. Talk about that some more, right? Tell me about their laugh. What did you like best about that? Because right? we just want that person to be over that. So that's a good point that you make. Thank you. And understanding cascading grief, and it's a little bit um, about the question earlier of, of multiple losses. Sometimes grief cascades down, and then the losses kind of intermingle. And we have to really know how to pull those apart and what those are about for people. <coughs> I want to just take a few last minutes, because our time is winding down, to talk about clinical interventions. <coughs> One of the things I like to do when I'm working with someone who has grief is, um, has anyone ever used a loss narrative or a loss characterization? I know we don't like the word loss back there. Right? But um, a loss characterization is a really great way to help people talk about and understand what they lost, um, what the grief is about for them. So a loss characterization is a story. And what I ask people to do is I want you to write a story about your loss from a third person perspective. And it can only be compassionate. So it's as though a compassionate, loving friend were telling your story before the loss, after the loss. What changed for you? What did that person mean to you? What did that thing mean to you? How, was that, how are you different now? Tell your story from a third person perspective. You can only be compassionate and loving and supportive. So before the loss, 
you know, she was loving, she was kind, she was full of life, she was energetic, she loved her father, she was connected, whatever that might be, and then after the loss, what was that like for you? Okay. It's a great way to help them begin telling their story and integrating that loss into how they understand themselves without saying get over it. Right? It's honoring what was that like, um, how was that loss for you? I find, art, anyone use art therapy in here? It's a really powerful way to do grief, even just giving it symbols or pictures, creating images that represent how we felt, what we miss most, what that loss is about. I do a lot of work with linking. Anyone use linking in grief work? Finding a linking piece. Link that person to the person they lost. We're so busy trying to pe tell people to let that person go, and what we really need to do is teach them how to hold on. Hold on to that person. Bring them forward with you. All right. What did you learn from them that you most want to take with you the rest of your life? Right? Yeah. I was going to say, it's interesting to me that guilt and shame relate to grief. Yes. And what she looked after a child whose father died, and she's grieving the relationship she didn't have with her father. Yes. When it wasn't good enough, yes. when they didn't share wonderful memories, mm -hmm. they didn't have mm -hmm. those. Yes. Absolutely, and that's the grief. That's a, like a uh, that's the cascading effect of grief. There's multiple losses in that, yeah. right? It's not just the loss of life. It's the loss of what you'd hoped for that you never got, yeah. right? The loss of opportunity to ever have a connection. Those things are really powerful pieces too. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, I we talked about already giving permission and asking questions, but using ceremony. I do a lot of ceremony work with people around grief, and it's very powerful. Sometimes I might use a labyrinth. We have access to a labyrinth or a, a cottonwood. So I use a labyrinth often. Um, I had a woman who um, uh, was grieving her mother's loss, and so, um, yes. Well, I, I think if someone's drinking a lot in, uh, in the aftermath of loss, we have to get the drinking addressed. Because we can't heal grief if someone's using substances to medicate. Because it affects their brain chemistry and their impact, and they're not going to heal. It just perpetuates that. So I think the foundational piece is we have to get someone to a place where we can get them sober, and then we can start that work. Yeah, that's a good question. I'm sorry for your sister's loss. That's, that's a hard one. Yeah. yeah it's just that we can't find a way in. Yeah. She's blaming Right. Yeah, she's in that tsunami, and she needs someone to come and help her. Yeah. Uh, sorry, it's a year now, and everybody's kind of, oh, well, it's okay. Yeah. To be expected. Yes. But I mean, it's like when she ought to kill herself, or... That's going to be the end result. If yeah. When someone's in that space, they really need containment and structure and get it, helping them get safe until they How can... How would you suggest to do that, like, from a family point of view? Like, yeah, so I would sometimes, because she may not be able to initiate that herself at this point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I'm happy to talk to you more about that afterward. Yeah. Um, I, we talked about assessing symptoms of, t of trauma and assessing suicide risk. Assess suicide risk, assess suicide risk, assess suicide risk. All right? We have to keep an eye on our people. We have to make sure that they're safe, and we have to ask, and we have to know. Ask. If you're not sure, ask is these guys are at high risk, high, high, high risk, right? And we gotta help keep them safe while they're in the tsunami, okay? Um, we talked about interrupting addictive patterns of thinking around the loss, of challenging, sometimes giving them an alternative image. Um, when I'm working with someone who's suicidal, one of the things I have them do is I have them come up with an art piece or something that closes the door to suicide. Visualize it. Paint it, draw it, and now I want you to think about that whenever you have suicide, I want you to look at the image. So we're connecting and we're changing the image in their brain. We're closing the door, barricade it, cement it, put iron bars in front of it, because as long as people are going through that door, it, it continues to connect with that addictive pattern. And they're not going to get better if they're allowing themselves to think about killing themselves. Right? So we have to challenge and you get in there firmly with that. Right? <clears throat> and. Um, so sometimes things 
are helpful in terms of trauma work, and sometimes in our early on with traumatic grief, I would not consider EMDR. People need more chance to process in grief, and that sometimes is a little too heavy-handed, right? I might consider some body work or some somatic experiencing, yoga, breathing, a lot of care, a lot of compassion, right? Um, a lot of invitation to talk about the loss and understand it. And avoid, we talked about those, avoid moving quickly. Avoid saying to somebody, well, it's been six months, we're done. Okay. It might take a long time, giving people time to grieve and, and not going slowly, allowing them to guide you and let you know where they're at. Don't shut that down too quickly. And uh, we know not to use platitudes, right? We talked about those platitudes earlier. Um, and we can assign meaning that doesn't fit for the person, right? So listening to what did the event mean to them, we can't assign that. Well, this must have meant such and such to you, right? We have to help them figure it out. Right? And they will get there. And finding meaning in what we've survived is essential to our recovery. But the meaning has to be ours. It can't be something that someone gave us. Right? What did that mean to you? And we can't compare our loss to something they may have experienced. Right? Oh, I know. My grandmother's friend's dog's uncle's aunt died last week. So I know how you feel. All right? So we don't want to go there. Um, and then avoid getting stuck. Sometimes I feel like if I'm working with someone who's really complicated, they put their complications on me so that I feel equally stuck and then we're both stuck together. Right? <laughs> um, so I'm always aware of that piece and being very careful not to get stuck there with them. They don't, want, they don't need us to be stuck. Compassion, yes. Stuck, no. So avoid getting stuck. Yes? Um, I'm wondering how much of the spot time you have with one person, one session, uh -huh. Uh -huh. I think it depends on the person. Um, some people have a difficulty talking and they're kind of shut down. I may ask more questions and try to get that open and talking. I like to hear from them a lot early on. I want them to tell me all the details. I'm going to ask a lot of questions that are inviting more detail and discussion so that they know that they can talk to me about anything that comes up. Because with grief, I don't want to shut anything down. Sometimes we want to structure people in sessions, right? And sometimes we want to just open grief. I want to open that up. I want to ask a lot of questions. Tell me more about that person. Right? Tell me how you met them. Tell me what it was like to fall in love with them. Tell me what it was like when your child was born. What was that like? What was special about them that you're really missing right now? Other questions? Yeah. Yes. 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 Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good question. I work a lot with trauma survivors, and, and, and I, I pull in grief work with those folks as well, and it's important to understand the, lo the losses in that, the loss of self, the loss of choice, the loss of one's voice. Right? the loss of how it was supposed to be and what they dreamed for their life versus the way that it is now, the loss of opportunity they foresee in the future, right? um, the loss of trust in others, all of those pieces that I think are so important. Yeah. Yes, that's a really good question. I think when we have an anticipated grief coming at some point, um, so full disclosure, my mother's a cancer survivor, five years, stage four. She's cancer free, yes. I'm, I'm very excited. We can clap. Someone was clapping. We can clap for that. But it's an anticipated grief, right? But one of the things that I practice a lot with my mom is that I tell her every day how much I love her, right? And I do those things that later I'm going to be really grateful I did. And we've had very open conversations. And they're hard. No one wants to have those conversations. They're terrible conversations to have. They're the worst, right? 
But the really nice thing is that there's an intimacy that you connect with when someone, when you're anticipating a loss. If we can just be open, so I think teaching our clients when they have an anticipated loss, when someone they love is sick or dying or there's a, a, a child who's ill who's dying, to have those really open conversations and teach them how to initiate and to say the things they need to say. Because that is a, there's a healing component of that. It doesn't make the loss easy, but it, it does reduce some of the factor, the risk factors for complicated grief. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, right, because that's, those are the things he needed to say. Here's what I'm gonna miss most about you, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Were there any other questions? Yeah. Um, I actually lost my dad like a few months, one, one, one year ago, and uh, about what you actually just mentioned. That, you know, and um, I actually went through lots of abuse concerning my dad, and mm -hmm. I spent my entire life trying to yeah. solve this. And I'm doing great, and I'm yeah. very proud of myself. Uh, but I, a lot of people around me uh, told me, well, why aren't you speaking about, you know, before he gets sick, he dies of cancer, why aren't you speaking to him about it? And I'm like, yeah, but go to see your dad and say, well, you raped me or something. Mm -hmm. That's such an easy thing to yeah. do. Yeah. So that made me angry. And uh, But the thing that I ended up doing is just like really doing what I believe was the best for myself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And after that, uh, b before he died, uh, a lot of friends around me, like good friends, I would say, would say the only thing I regret is not being able to speak to my, my parents about yeah. this. And one of my closest friends uh, lost his dad. He, he told me I was about to talk to him, uh, but he, he actually stepped out of the kitchen and I did not grab his arm to talk to him and he died the, the day after. Yeah. And he said, just go to talk to him because you will regret it. So I did not know how to handle that because I, you know, I was the kind of a person who always, you know, um, blamed myself and loved my father, you know, instead. Yeah. So I actually started to write a letter, you know, to him, Good. and telling him everything that, you know, like basically summarizing my whole life with him and starting with everything that was amazing with our, you know, in our yeah. relationship. Uh, and then saying, and then there was that and that. Yeah. But like just mentioning it because I didn't want yeah. to blame him either. Yeah. And and then I went to the hospital to talk to him face to face, and that was difficult because uh, like three weeks after that he died. Yeah. So um, he actually did not um, um, admit yeah. that he had committed that. Yeah. And so and I told him, you know, it doesn't change the fact that I love you and that I'm proud of what I am because yeah. I know I am what I am because of what you are as mm -hmm. well. But I remember stepping out of his room being so desperate, saying he did not say sorry. Uh, yeah. And and after that I said, you know, to myself, I'm like, well, at least you just get out of yeah. you know, of yourself and you're free from this, like for for real, yeah. for good. Yeah. And so That's a really brave thing you did. Yeah. Yeah, um, I think that in those kind of situations, that's a very complex grief that you're describing, very complicated. And I think it heals in layers. And I think saying your truth, whether he could accept it, hear it, you said what you needed to say. And um, not that that changes your experience, right? But that there was a powerful piece of you that came forward and did the thing that you needed to do in the moment. Right? And he wasn't in a space where he could accept his, his part of that. Um, but I feel really honored that you shared your story today. Yeah, thank you. All right, I think our time is up. Yeah? Well, 